Good day. Today, Tuesday 28th March 2023 has dawned and so far we have not seen any Ukrainian counterattacks, be it the big counteroffensive we've been hearing so much about in Zaporozhian region or the local counterattack in the Bakhmut area to try to break the siege of Bakhmut or indeed a um, operation further north in the Kremena Yesvatovo area, all areas, as I said, where there's been talk of Ukrainian counter-attack operations. However, that doesn't mean necessarily that such an attack at some point is not going to come. In fact, I consider it a foregone conclusion that somewhere, some place along the battle lines, Ukraine will launch its counter-attack at some point in the next few days or weeks or possibly even months. It's worth pointing out or reminding ourselves that a short while ago the US media was predicting the date, the time for the Ukrainian offensive as being May. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it will happen then. Russian commentators have cautioned that it might happen sooner. But anyway, sooner or later, undoubtedly, some sort of a counterattack somewhere along the battle lines is surely going to take place. And I would add that Western military equipment to support this counterattack is now arriving in Ukraine. Yesterday there was confirmation that Ukraine has received its 18 Leopard 2 tanks from Germany, along with the 40 Marder infantry fighting vehicles. Um, Ukraine also appears to have received its 14 Challenger 2 tanks from Britain. And no doubt the Ukraine has also received some of the other armoured vehicles that Britain has also supplied. We've been hearing reports for some days, some weeks now actually, about the supply in dribs and drabs of armoured vehicles and tanks from Poland. The Polish tanks are a mixture of um, Leopard 2s and modernised T-72s uh, that Poland itself builds. PT-91, and as I said, sooner or later, all of this equipment is presumably going to be used on the battlefronts in some sort of military operation. There was also, I have to say, a most extraordinary report from France. In some ways, I have to say this, for me, almost an insulting report from France if you um, accept the Ukrainian um, view that they need all the ammunition and all the artillery and all the firepower they can get in order to launch a counteroffensive. And this is that uh, the French Armed Forces Minister, Sébastien Lecornu, uh, reported that um, France will double its supply of 155 millimeter shells to Ukraine. And he said that we will supply the ground equipment needed for the Ukrainian counteroffensive. We will double the supply of 155 millimeter shells. From the end of March, they will be supplied with 2,000 rounds of shells per month. Now that's 2,000 shells per month. Ukraine fires on an average day 5,000, well, perhaps it's less than that, plausibly, perhaps more plausibly, 3,000 rounds of shells, 155 millimeter shells a day. So France is going to supply each month less than a day's worth of shells for Ukraine. And, of course, Ukraine is going to be horribly short of ammunition. It is already horribly short of ammunition as it contemplates launching this offensive. I've discussed this at length in previous programmes. Brian Belletic has 
discussed it in even greater length. There's going to be huge shortages of ammunition, but nonetheless, despite that, Ukraine, it seems, is going to launch this offensive at some point soon. And it's going to do that against heavily fortified Russian positions. We've seen satellite photos of the enormous fortifications that the Russians have built in the Zaporozhye area and also in the Kremenaya Svatovo area. How exactly Ukraine hopes to break through these defences without artillery support, without much in the way of air support. It turns out that even the reports of 33 MiG-29 fighter jets equipped with JDAM glide bombs might be over-optimistic. The glide bombs are indeed being supplied, but the MiG-29s are not appearing in anything like the necessary quantity. Well, I'm not going to discuss the problems of this. Maybe there is a way round. I'm not sure. But anyway, that's where we are on the Ukrainian side. I would have thought that the Ukrainian officials must be, well, I'm going to say sceptical. Angry might be a more valid word when they hear that France is trumpeting the fact that it's going to double the supply of shells to Ukraine from 1,000 a month to 2,000 a month, when, as I said, that's less than a day's use. And in the meantime, I should say that other NATO countries, Austria, Bulgaria now, which is a major supplier of shells and equipment to Ukraine in the first year of the war, and um, it seems the Czech Republic have come forward and said that they're basically out of equipment that they can now send to Ukraine and Ukraine can no longer expect further supply of equipment from them. Well, on the other side of the fence, I've discussed the enigmas of Russian shell and tank production. Um, regardless, it's clear that the Russians are able to produce tanks and shells in quantities that so far Ukraine simply hasn't been able to match. And later in this program, I'm going to discuss certain comments that the Chinese media have been making about this. And I want to stress the Chinese media, because as is so often the case, I feel that they have a more realistic understanding of what is going on here than some people in the West appear to do. But anyway, let's um, move on and also discuss what's actually going on on the battlefronts. Now, we've had confirmation now from the Russians that they have gained control of the Azon plant in Bakhmut. This is now actual formal confirmation of this. And it comes, interestingly, from Denis Pushilin, who is the acting head of the Russian-appointed government of the Donetsk People's Republic. And the TASS report reads as follows. Russian forces have almost completely mopped up the industrial premises of the non-ferrous metal processing plant in Artyomovsk, that's to say Black Bakhmut, Denis Pushilin said on Tuesday. Fighters from the Wagner group are working quite hard, reliably, uh, um, Pushilin said to Russian television, Solovyov live TV show. So far, they have made even the slightest attempts to deliver combat ammo loads and reserve supplies or take out those wounded extremely difficult. The enemy is struggling to do so because Wagner fighters already have all roads under fire control. So uh, Pushilin is confirming that so far Ukraine is having real problems in resupply in Bakhmut. It's unable to deliver, or at least it's having great difficulties delivering ammunition and reserve supplies and taking out wounded people. 
from Bergman. And then Schilling went on to say, as for the city itself, it was important to mop up the industrial site of the Azon plant itself. And the guys are finishing off Ukrainian troops who now are only to be found in solitary groups. Now, that is essentially what I guessed was the case yesterday. As I said, I've seen film of the Azom plant. As I said, this gigantic, typical Soviet industrial facility, very decrepit looking, very almost derelict as far as I can see. I doubt that much industrial activity has been going on there for many, many years now. And that's putting aside the, as I said, damage from firepower and all that sort of thing from the fighting. But such as it is, it's enormous and it's overwhelmingly likely, even if the Russians have overall control of the Azon plant, that there will be still some Ukrainian stragglers hidden away in odd corners. And of course, the Russians will be combing through the Azon plant to track down these isolated groups of soldiers and to bring it fully under control. So it's clear that the Azon plant now is to all intents and purposes under Russian control. By contrast, that report that I discussed yesterday about the avant-garde stadium being under Russian control, that is wrong. It seems the Ukrainians are still located there. They're still holding out in the avant-garde stadium. That is the other big building, edifice in Bakhmut, which in my opinion is the major uh, position, the other major fortified position that the Ukrainians have within Bakhmut. As I said previously, once the avant-garde stadium is captured by the Russians, I say once, but we'll come to that shortly. Then my own personal view is that the major fight in Bakhmut is probably done. It may take some while to clear the Ukrainians out of the remaining parts of the town, but progress now, it seems to me, would be unstoppable if one absence possibilities like Ukrainian counterattacks once the avant-garde stadium falls. And in fact, all through yesterday and early this morning, there were dribbles of reports, not always very easy to confirm or understand, at least not by me, that the Russians have crossed the Bakhmutka River in all kinds of places, that they're pressing deep now into the centre of Bakhmut, that they're gradually fighting and clearing Ukrainian positions. And I think that we can say that for the moment, the priority for the Russians is almost certainly to clear up Bakhmut itself, to finally bring this heavily contested, this hotly contested town under control. And yes, there are also reports of heavy fighting going on around those various villages that I've discussed around Bakhmut, Ivanivska, Orekhovo, uh, Vasilyevka, Khromovo. But as I said, I'm not sure that the Russians are actually planning to storm these places exactly. It seems more plausible that they're just keeping up the pressure on these villages to make sure that the roads, the asphalt roads, that pass through these villages, especially Khromovo and Ivanivska, remain out of use to the Ukrainians. So, quite a lot going on in Bakhmut, and it does seem as if the Russians are making significant pro progress. Now, in the meantime, we've had further comments by General Sirsky who is Ukraine's ground forces commander. And some of the things that he was saying at one point seemed to imply that Ukraine was indeed thinking of some kind of counterattack in and around Bakhmut. But his latest words, Sirsky's latest reported words, seem to me 
to somewhat argue against that. Now, I'm going to take a report of what he said from The Guardian, which is a British newspaper, and it's from a video which the Ukrainians have posted. And this is what The Guardian says. In a video showing Sirsky addressing soldiers in what appeared to be a large industrial warehouse... Sirsky said Russia was continuing to focus on the Bakhmut area after months of battle. As of today, our main task is to wear down the overwhelming forces of the enemy and inflict heavy losses on them. It will create the necessary conditions to help liberate Ukrainian land and speed up our victory. Now, that is an interesting... <laughs> statement because he doesn't seem to suggest a counterattack in the Bakhmut area. He's talking about our main task being to wear down the overwhelming forces of the enemy and inflict heavy losses on them, which suggests a defensive approach, at least that's the way I see it, and that suggests that if there was a Ukrainian plan, to carry out a counterattack, then, judging from these words, the Ukrainians have abandoned it because the forces of the enemy, in Sirsky's words, in the Bakhmut area, are overwhelming. Now, of course, this might be misinformation intended to deceive the Russians. On balance, I suspect it's true. Now, I would say that weather conditions have changed on the Ukrainian battlefields over the last couple of days. I understand that um, temperatures have risen and the ground is drying out and becoming harder. And that ought to be facilitating any Ukrainian counterattacks in the Bakhmut area. But, as I said, if we judge from Sirsky's words, that doesn't seem to be exactly what is happening. On the contrary, what we get are reports that the Ukrainians are instead continuing to funnel troops into Bakhmut itself. I discussed yesterday that report about special forces being sent there, which, for the record, seems to me a waste of the lives of these valuable and presumably expensive to train soldiers. But anyway, there we go. Now, elsewhere on the battle lines, in Marinka and in Avdeyevka, it's the Russians who are gaining more from the drying of the ground. There are fewer Ukrainian reserve troops in Avdeyevka and in Marinka, and with the ground starting to harden, it seems as if the Russians are able to accelerate their advances around most places. And I've seen a report from a Russian journalist who seems to be in Marinka itself, or at least close to it, and he's saying that the Russians are widening their control around Marinka, which is an interesting phrase, which I don't completely understand, by the way, but it does seem as if they're uh, gaining ground. He suggests that the number of troops on each side that are fighting in Marinka is not very big, that it's to be counted in dozens, groups of dozens of men, rather than hundreds of men. So Marinka clearly is a much smaller battle than uh, Bakhmut. But anyway, the overall impression I'm getting is that the Russians have been making more progress there and that they do expect that they will perhaps force Ukrainian troops out of Marinka fairly soon or perhaps even encircle them there. And something fairly similar seems to be happening in the Avdeevka area. So again, reports are not always entirely easy to make much sense of, and I'm going to have to wait a 
until my next video to see whether I can provide a fuller discussion of how things are turning out in these places. Now, there do remain certain enigmas about Russian behaviour. Now, first of all, there's been more reports of the Russians beefing up their air forces in Ukraine, that apparently more Suhoi 35 fighter jets have now been deployed um, to support the Russian air operations in Ukraine. By the way, it's some time since I got saw reports of any Russian fighter jet or aircraft being shot down by the Ukrainians over Ukraine. Just saying. But anyway, apparently Suhoi 35s are now operating in greater numbers. Maybe that's in preparation for the deployment of these MiG-29 fighter jets. But perhaps the most intriguing news is of increasing Russian airstrikes on Ukrainian positions around the northern town of Sumy. Now, this is located quite close to the Russian border, and there have been many reports of Russian activity there, air activity, and indeed, by the way, also shelling of, of Ukrainian positions in and around Sumy by Russian artillery. But recently, uh, Russian fighter jets or fighter bombers have apparently been dropping glide bombs, precision-guided glide bombs, the Russian equivalent of the JDAM bombs, on Ukrainian fortified positions in and around Sumy. And the big unanswered question is why are they doing that? Is it because they're planning some kind of attack there? Or is it because they want the Ukrainians to worry that they might be planning some kind of attack there. Now, Sumi, on the map, on the kind of maps that I see, looks to be reasonably close to Kiev. It was one of those places um, a year ago, which the Russians, um, well, they actually briefly occupied it on their way to Kiev, during the advance that took place in February, March of 2022, then they actually pulled out of Sumy, even though, as I said, they actually largely captured the town. <laughs> and then when they didn't advance straight into Kiev, they basically put Sumy itself under siege and another place, another bigger town, not far away called Chernigov, that also they placed both of those places under a kind of temporary siege. All of this before they made the decision at the end of March 2022 to pull out of both uh, of all of these territories in northern Ukraine following what looked like a draft peace agreement that had been agreed in Istanbul. Well, I'm not going to go back to all that story. Now, I, I suspect that distances between Sumy and Kiev are greater than they look on a map. Remember, I find it very difficult to read maps, and I don't think that we should think of Sumy actually as a neighboring town to Kiev. But of course, if there is a Russian plan to advance on Sumy, conceivably even to capture the place, then I suspect that will put considerable additional pressure on Ukraine. They'll have to start worrying about Kiev again, and they might have to start worrying about the situation in their other northern towns and cities, Chernigov, Kharkov, and the others. And there are lots of reports now that because of the strain on Ukrainian forces on the Donbass front, and because of the need to, combat, to concentrate Ukrainian troops for the much-talked-about offensive in Zaporozhye region, that the Ukrainians have had to strip the 
northern frontier, this area where Sumy is located, of troops that Ukrainian defences in this area are not as strong as they might be. And it could be that the Ukrainians are relying now heavily on fortifications that they presumably try to build in this area since the fighting in this area in March and that they might have tried to build pillboxes and lay minefields. And of course, as I've discussed many times, the fact that the Russians are using bombs, bombs, it turns out, are more effective in destroying fortifications and fortified positions than artillery is. Now, there's another interesting fact about the attack on Sumi, these air attacks on Sumi, because note that they're taking place in a part of Ukraine that is not so remote from Kiev. Now, I said that I don't think that Sumy and Kiev are exactly adjoining cities, but if we're talking about S-300 missiles, then these air defence missiles that Ukraine has ha have formed the backbone of Ukraine's air defence system. Um, it's they presumably do have the range to intercept Russian aircraft in the Sumy area if launched from Kiev and its environs. And there's been lots of reports that Ukraine has concentrated a large proportion of its air defence assets in and around Kiev. But note that there isn't a single report of Ukrainian air defences shooting down any of these Russian aircraft that are carrying out these bomb attacks on Ukrainian positions in Sumy. Now, I accept you're talking about glide bombs. You don't have to launch them from directly above the target. You can presumably launch them from some distance, but these, these are not rocket bombs. You presumably have to be within fairly close range of the target to be able to drop one of these things. And as I said, surely that is within range of S-300 missiles located in the Kiev area. Now, the fact that the Russians are able to conduct airstrikes in and around Sumy suggests to me that the situation with Ukrainian air defences is indeed poor and that Ukraine doesn't any longer have the kind of fully equipped air defence that it used to have earlier in the war, that those Russian cruise missile strikes on the energy facilities, which I've come to the conclusion, were at least as much focused on depleting Ukraine's supply of S-300 air defence missiles that that's had its effect, even if the Ukrainians are holding back some of these missiles, are conserving the stock that they have, which is why they're not using them to shoot down these Russian fighter jets carrying out these bomb raids on Sumy. Well, that in itself effectively would confirm that the Ukrainians are now very short of air defence missiles, that they just don't have enough to try to cover all positions or to take down even valuable targets like Russian fighter jets. So that might also be, by the way, one further reason why the Russians are carrying out these airstrikes. They might be
carrying them out in part to test the effectiveness of Ukrainian air defences to see whether these are in any sense any longer in any sort of effective condition. These are, of course, guesses, but, you know, you can look at these facts and you can draw your own conclusions. And if you don't agree, well, that's fine. And I'd be very interested to know your views. But anyway, these these attacks, as I said, these airstrikes on Sumi are intriguing. And for the record, I can't imagine, again, that the Russians would be launching airstrikes in the Sumi region, carrying out these kinds of airstrikes with these expensive precision-guided glide bombs if they didn't have some kind of operational plan for Sumi and for the area around it. And I would guess that at some point we're going to see these Russian forces that are now concentrated on the border, the Ukraine's northern border, brought into action. Now, in discussing all of these airstrikes, these Russian airstrikes, I would also say that yesterday, over the course of the previous night, there was another big Russian Geranium-2 drone attack across Ukraine. Now, the Ukrainians again claimed that they shot down a significant number of these Geranium-2 drones, and perhaps they did, but it's also clear that quite a few of them got through and hit their targets, and quite a few seem to have been concentrated on the Kiev area. And we come back to this point that perhaps it's not entirely a good use of de reducing numbers of air defence systems to use them up shooting down these cheap, mass-produced and easily produced drones. But anyway, that is what we see happening. Now, even as the Russians have been launching repeated drone strikes across Ukraine, there's been rumours that Ukraine, in support of its offensive, is now planning to launch mass drone strikes on Crimea especially. There's been an article about this in the Financial Times. The Ukrainians have not managed to get Atakam's missiles from the United States. Apparently, the United States, the US military is determined, has made a decision that it's absolutely not going to provide these missiles. In theory, it's because that would be too great a provocation against the Russians. In reality, I think, it's because there simply aren't enough of these missiles to provide to Ukraine in the quantity that Ukraine wants and needs without depleting US stocks of these important missiles to dangerous levels. And the result is that without large numbers of aircraft, F-16s not being supplied, Typhoons not being supplied, Finland has now said that it's not providing F-18 Hornets either. So Western aircraft are not being supplied. Numbers of MiG-29s are being supplied, but nowhere near in the quantities that Ukraine needs. And Ukraine has complained that these are not really the kind of aircraft it wants or needs anyway. That may or may not be correct. Whether F-16s are superior to MiG-29s, I'm not going to even talk about. I really just don't know. But anyway, because of this shortage of aircraft and this shortage of big missiles, Ukraine is having to resort, apparently, to drones. And there's talk that just as the Ukra Russians have been using Iranian-sourced Geranium-2 drones to launch these big strikes across Ukraine, Ukraine is planning to launch saturation drone strikes on Crimea. 
and supposedly they bought up to 1,000 drones from Taiwan in order to do that. And this could very plausibly be true. And I can ima imagine that launching large swarms of these drones on Crimea um, would be very much part of the Ukrainian plan. And I'm not going to say some of these drones might get through and they might cause some problems. But <laughs> again, Russia has far more sophisticated air defences than Ukraine does. And, of course, it also has um, systems like the TOR, um, mobile anti-tank system, and the Panzer gun missile system, which are probably, well, are definitely far more effective in shooting down drones than any system Ukraine possesses. So it might be a more challenging and difficult thing for Ukraine to do than the Ukrainians expect. And then there is this other defence that the Russians have shown that they can use in terms of countering drones, which, to be straightforward about, I don't fully understand. I don't fully understand how it works. And I'm not sure whether it would work at all against you know, kamikaze drones, drones like the Geranium-2, and or strike drones, and whatever drones Ukraine is intending to launch against Crimea. But anyway, it does seem that the Russians have been able to use electronic warfare systems in which they're acknowledged masters to somehow affect Ukrainian drone op operations. There have been all kinds of reports of how the U Russians have been able to jam or even take control of Ukrainian drones. There was a report way back in September in the Washington Post about how Ukrainian soldiers fighting in the Kherson counteroffensive constantly faced the problem that they, their every move was being monitored by the Russians using their Orlan 10 drones, whereas Ukrainian drones were constantly being captured by Russian electronic warfare systems and would simply disappear from Ukrainian control. How about surveillance drones? Now, strike drones don't operate that way. They're presumably sent on a pre-controlled flight path. But it seems that the Russians even have some way of interfering with the operations of these drones. And I'm not going to try and guess how that's done. As all of you must know by now, I'm the least technical of men. By the way, just the other day, Ukraine tried to launch another one of its Strizh drones. These are these converted Soviet-era um, jet-powered reconnaissance drones, which Ukraine has converted into cruise missiles. They tried to launch another one of these drones to attack deep into Russia. And apparently the Russians brought it down in the Tula area, again using electronic warfare um, systems. Um, it landed apparently near a residential area. Um, some people were injured, some damage was done, but whatever it was, it didn't strike, it didn't reach whatever target it was apparently aimed at. So the Russians also have that line of defense against drones. One. I'm not going to pretend I fully understand, but it's clear again that Ukraine has been forced once more into expedience, like using swarms of drones to attack heavily defended and fortified Russian positions in Crimea and elsewhere, because it lacks the artillery, the long-range missiles, 
and the bombers, the aircraft bombers, to be able to launch really effective air attacks. And as I said, the drones might not be an adequate substitute. There's an article in the Wall Street Journal which says that if and when Ukraine does launch its counteroffensive, which of course it is going to launch, it will not be the kind of, like the kind of counteroffensive that the US military launches. When the US conducted its operation against Iraq in 1991, the nearest approximation, I suppose, to the kind of offensive Ukraine is planning to launch in, against the Russians in Ukraine, the United States spent weeks, months, bombing Iraqi fortifications, Iraqi air defense systems to suppress those Iraqi air defense systems and to cause major damage to those Iraqi fortifications before it launched its ground forces. And Ukraine is not going to be able to do, so it seems, that's the view the Wall Street Journal is taking, it's not going to be able to do either of these things. And yet, it's still going to launch this counteroffensive. And f for the record, there's now an accumulation of reports that undoubtedly, because of the position the president is taking, Joe Biden is taking, after the debate that I've been talking about in the United States, the debate which extends all the way back to that Rand Corporation study, which said that it was against the US interest for there to be a prolonged war in Ukraine, um, and that Ukraine, there was no clear path, there was no path to victory for Ukraine in the war. Well, it's clear to me that the hardliners, the neocons if you prefer, have for the moment at least won the internal battle and they're determined to have this counteroffensive. That all doubts expressed by various people, by Mark Milley from time to time when he's able to screw up the courage to come out and make his doubts known by that interesting personage, Spengler, who, whose commentary in Asia Times I discussed yesterday. All of those doubts have been suppressed and the insistence for this counteroffensive is now on. Anyway, we will see what happens. And as I said, in the meantime, the Russian build-up continues. Now, there have been some rather interesting comments about from the Russians about Ukrainian military deployments. Um, uh, Andrei Marochko has uh, told TASS that there's a, a relocation of a large number of military convoys of Ukrainian armed forces was noted through the Kupiansk populated locality. Some convoys are headed in the direction of the Novozelovskoye community, and some of them are going towards Izium. According to eyewitnesses, the entire road from Izium to Slavyansk is literally packed with the equipment and manpower of the Ukrainian armed forces. And um, Marochko has also told TASS that Ukrainian troops stationed on the Kupiansk front uh, crab self-propelled howitzers designed in Poland. So there's clearly some kind of a big deployment by the Ukraine happening around there. It's be interesting to see whether this is intended to be offensive or defensive, um, whether Ukraine is going to try and attack in multiple places at the same time. We'll see. But anyway, that's one report from the Russians that there is, as I said, a big deployment 
going on in this area of the battlefronts as well as in Zaporozhye. Though I get the sense that this time, unlike the situation last fall, the Russians are far better prepared for attacks in this area than they were last fall. As I said, they have all those huge fortifications and they have vastly more troops and better equipped troops than they did, as I said, in Kharkov and Kherson last year. So we'll see what happens. And there's also been a very interesting um, discussion um, in the Russian media about tanks. And this comes from Neza Vizimaya Gazeta, a well important Russian newspaper. And it carries this commentary. Uh, NATO officials say that the offensive is unlikely to be successful without heavy artillery support. Efforts are being made to solve this problem by a way of launching of Ukraine launching the production of Soviet standard munitions. This won't be a quick fix because the process requires specialists, industrial sites and resources. That said, the Ukrainian armed forces will continue to be starved of ammunition for some time, perhaps for a long time, until the end of the conflict. Colonel Nikolai Shulgin, a retired military expert, uh, told the newspaper. Um, Shulgin pointed out that in Russia, ammunition production had significantly increased according to ammunition uh, official statements. I've discussed this many times. To be honest, I think the odds of Ukraine getting artillery production um, shell production up and running again is extremely remote. I think any attempt to do so will result in immediate Russian missile strikes against whatever industrial facilities are doing that in Ukraine. And besides, where would Ukraine get the machine tools and the trained people to do that? But anyway, that's something that Shulgin spoke about. And... Uh, <laughs> Um, obviously, this plan to try to start restart ammunition production in Ukraine, which to me looks desperate, if it exists at all, is another recognition that the West can't supply Ukraine with the ammunition it needs. And then Shulgin goes on to say, this is again all taken from uh, um, ne Nezavisimaya Gazeta, um, Shulgin then went on to say, Deputy Chairman of the Russian Security Council, Dmitry Medvedev, has also confirmed the significant increases in ammunition production and added that the domestic defence industry will produce 1,500 tanks in 2023. And then we have comments from another Russian ex-Russian, uh, retired Russian officer, Lieutenant General Yuri Netkachev. 1,500 tanks, this is the new production tanks that Medvedev is talking about, will be enough to form five tank divisions in Russia. They will be a force to be reckoned with. So that's five tank divisions, 300 tanks per division, will be indeed a very, very powerful force. And that, of course, comes on top of the existing large numbers of tanks that the Russian army has. And, as I said, I've discussed the enigma of whether these are uh, new build tanks or a combination of new build and refurbished Russian tanks. I've seen had lots of commentaries and discussions about what Medvedev meant and what Putin meant in an interview each of these two gentlemen gave recently. And I'm not going to discuss this further. But anyway, whatever, the Russians expect to have 1,500 tanks coming off the assembly lines over the course of this year. And 
then Net Karchev discusses the older tanks. T-54, T-55 and T-62 tanks are in demand for the ongoing special operation. According to open sources, there are up to 10,000 tanks of this type at the Russian Armed Forces' storage depots. There are also several million shells for them. Several million shells for them. Just let's keep that in mind. Under the operating instructions adopted back in the Soviet era, they were put away for long-term storage across the country's military districts. The tank's components were maintained to be combat ready. Upgraded advanced tanks such as the T-72, T-80 and T-90 will be used for the breakthrough. However, the Soviet armoured vehicles of the past century will play an important, if not decisive, role on the second and third lines in the tactical order of battle, Nikolaev explained. Ukraine does not have such Soviet tanks because the country received only modern military equipment after the collapse of the Warsaw Pact. However, this equipment was destroyed in the first year of the special military operation. These are the T-64s that Ukraine operated, which were the main part of Ukraine's tank force last year. And this is why Ukraine, why Kiev keeps asking NATO to send its tanks and other weapons to the Ukrainian armed forces. Meanwhile, Russia is only beginning to unpack its Soviet-era reserves, which are immense. So the idea is simply this. You use your tanks, your advanced, your modern tanks, of which you're already going to have more than Ukraine has, its total number of tanks. You're going to use them to defeat Ukrainian tank forces, to fight Ukrainian tanks, destroy Ukrainian tanks and to carry out breakthroughs. And then once you've broken through and Ukrainian forces are smashed, you will then throw in your second and third line troops, mainly infantry presumably, but backed by these Soviet tanks. And by that point, with Ukraine's armoured forces essentially broken, you will be able to advance forward irresistibly. Well, whether or not that's true, whether that's entirely correct, I'm not sure. But it is consistent, or so it seems to me, with Brian Boletic's analysis that these tanks, these Soviet-era tanks, are envisaged for use more as infantry support vehicles, in other words, as assault guns, rather than as tanks themselves. And Brian Boletic made a very interesting point, which I wasn't aware of yesterday, which is that the tank gun of the T-55 tank, in particular, has a significantly longer range than the smooth more smooth bore guns of modern tanks which might make it a fairly effective piece of mobile artillery supplementing the other artillery that Russia has and notice what Nikolaev says that the Russians have millions of rounds of ammunition for these tanks that's perhaps the key to this this is another use of tanks, of these old tanks, to saturate the battlefield with artillery. Anyway, whilst I'm on the topic of the Russian media, I'm going to discuss what um, Andrei Kelin, the Russian ambassador to Britain, has said to another Russian newspaper, which is Izvestia. Now, the Russians are making it clear that their decision to establish 
locations for the storage of tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus is a counter to, Ukra to Britain's supply of depleted Ukrainian shells to Ukraine. That's, by the way, proving to be controversial in Ukraine itself. I'm getting reports that there's even a petition up and running in Ukraine to try to stop Uk the Ukrainian military from using these shells. There are some Ukrainians who are worried about the polluting effects, the poison effects that these shells would have on the Ukrainian environment. And by the way, on that topic, there was a petition that was going to be made to the British Parliament uh, to stop Britain from supplying these shells. Um, and the person who was organising that petition communicated it to me, and I was going to publish a link to it on this channel. But the last report I saw is that the British authorities have blocked this petition um, and they're examining whether this petition is worthwhile. So for the moment at least, I can't do that. And I suspect the reason is that the depleted uranium shells have already been supplied to Ukraine. They're already in Ukraine. Now there are apparently photos, I haven't seen them, of Ukrainian sh soldiers handling these shells. Anyway, I'm going to say again that I cannot understand the complaints and the anger about the deployment of these tactical nuclear weapons by Russia in Belarus. To be very clear, any deployment of nuclear weapons is for me something that I don't welcome at all. I consider it extremely dangerous. But to talk about it as an escalation, given how many tactical nuclear weapons the United States has deployed across Europe, and I, I, I find it bizarre. I find it absolutely extraordinary. Um, I think people who make these kind of claims ought to perhaps look in the mirror and ask themselves why if it's wrong for the Russians to do this sort of thing, is it all right for the West to do it? Anyway, Ambassador Kellen had a number of things to say about Britain. And this is, as I said, a TAS summary of his interview with his Vestia. And he was asked about the supply of depleted uranium shells by Britain to Ukraine, and Kelly said that Britain was doing it in order to create the impression that it was a leader amongst US satellites. Today's London sees its goal as being always and everywhere at the head of the collective West's party of war. In this way, it expects to form some semblance of leadership amongst US satellites. This is the manifestation of a former empire whose influence has been fading for decades. It is also an attempt to divert attention from growing economic problems. They are guided by the logic that the war is to blame for everything. That's why they are deliberately escalating things. The British don't care at all about long-term consequences, including those for Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. London's actions are driven by its sense of irresponsibility and impunity. The British establishment believes that it can control the constant raising of stakes in the conflict. They try to ignore those who talk about the most extreme and severe consequences. We, in turn, keep pointing to London's violation of the fundamental principles of international law. All the crimes, including the supply of banned weapons, are being documented. We won't leave them unanswered. And then Kellen discusses relations between Moscow and London. 
He says that they've never been easy. But then he goes on to say the present day elites in Britain and other Western European countries emerged after the United States had secured its dominance on the continent. Once they took power, their members could not fathom being bound by the limits set by Atlanticist ideas. They're happy to be part of the West's common policy against Moscow and Beijing. Besides, the British economy strong, currently strongly depends on Washington's goodwill. And in many respects, London ruined relations with our country by its own doings. Well, you don't hear very much about the Russian side of what's gone wrong in Anglo-Russian relations. So I did think it might help if I published the Russian ambassador's comments, since we're unlikely to see them, reported in very much detail in the British media. And I would just focus on that particular line in this Investia interview for British viewers. This is a manifestation of the malady of a former empire whose influence has been fading for decades. And there are other points that he makes, which perhaps I'm not so sure about, but on that specific one, to be frank, I can't say that he seems to me to be significantly wrong. Anyway, I'm now going to turn to what the Chinese are saying about the situation in Ukraine, about the state of the battlefields. And this comes from a long commentary piece in Global Times by its former editor, Hu Xitin. And he is a fairly interesting figure because apparently he was somebody who was something of a critic of the Chinese government at some point, but he then became very disillusioned with the West. As I say, he became an editor, the editor of Global Times. He's no longer the editor today, but he's its leading commentator. And I suspect that he is um, very close to official thinking in Beijing. And he says this, he says that the US is getting anxious as Russia has survived the war of attrition against the entirety of NATO. And he makes various points, and it's important to say that he is not a commentator about war. And um, he talks about the fact that this is a war of attrition. And as I said, I would take issue with some of his figures, but never mind. I don't think this is the key point. He says this, um, that overall, Ukraine has been a provide a clear indication of the industrial nature of war. Indisputably correct. Brian Baletic has been saying it. Lieutenant Colonel Alex Vashinin has been saying it. I've been saying it. The Duran has been saying it. Lots of people have been saying it. The result, this is going back to Xi Jinping, depends on which side can produce more tanks and artillery. Both, are using, both sides are using artillery like machine guns. 100 shells may not be enough to eliminate a single soldier. Well, I'm not sure whether that's right, but anyway. And then he goes on to say, Ukraine's own arsenal factories have been destroyed by Russia, and Ukraine's daily firing of 5,000 shells, I think that's an exaggeration, by the way, I think it's closer to 3,000 shells, is equivalent to the annual supply of a small NATO country. Actually, as we've seen... France can only supply Ukraine. Maximum it can supply is 2,000 shells, 155 millimeter shells a month, less than what Ukraine is using in a day. But anyway, to continue, the United States originally purchased 15,000 shells per month, 
But the outbreak of the Ukraine war led to a sharp increase in NATO purchases for aid. Western media have exclaimed that the sum of all NATO countries' shells is not enough to meet the needs of Ukraine on the battlefield. Even if the Russian military is firing 20,000 shells a day, their ability to supply is still shocking the West. Where are these shells coming from? The West believes that Russia has purchased some low-quality shells from North Korea, but North Korea does not produce so many shells. Therefore, Russia cannot be underestimated. Although its economy is not large and is, is seen as poor in the eyes of the West, its military-industrial mobilization capabilities are obviously stronger and more effective than those of the West. The military industrial foundation left over from World War II and the Cold War has at least been partially activated at critical moments to supply ammunition to the frontline troops. In addition, Russia has air superiority in Ukraine and long range missile strike capabilities, which can more effectively destroy Ukrainian ammunition depots causing many weapons provided by the West to Ukraine to be destroyed before they can be used. And then we come to the critical points that Husitin makes. The US and West have found it much more difficult than expected to defeat Russia. They know that China has not provided military aid to Russia, and the question that haunts them is, if Russia alone is already so difficult to deal with, what if Russia, what if China really starts to provide military aid to Russia using its massive industrial capabilities for the Russian military? Would the situation on the battle, Ukrainian battlefield fundamentally change. Further, Russia alone can already confront the entire West in Ukraine. If they really force China and Russia to join hands, what changes will there be in the world's military situation? And I think he's put his finger on it. If the Western powers cannot manage, cannot manage to match Russia in industrial output of things like shells and tanks, and even bombs and missiles and surface-to-air missiles, what chance have they against China with its vastly greater industrial base, let alone China and Russia combined. And I think that is what the West needs to understand. It needs the, it's the thought that they need to really focus upon. Now, on that topic, a couple of weeks ago, at the time of that grotesque Chinese balloon incident, which dominated the headlines in the United States for, well, something like a week. We were hearing that President Biden wanted to telephone and speak to, uh, um, Xi, Jinping, uh, to Xi, Xi Jinping to try to clear the air. What we now learn is that there's been lots of attempts by the United States to try and set up some kind of a telephone call with Xi Jinping, and that hasn't happened. There were also lots of talk about Xi Jinping speaking to Zelensky in shortly after Xi Jinping's visit to Moscow. And the US has been pressing the Chinese for that call to Kiev but that hasn't happened either. Now, there's been a very interesting article about this um, from US 
News and World Report. Dates 24th March. It's again quite recent. And I'll read extracts of it. President Biden said last month, after a US fighter jet shot down a suspected Chinese spy balloon, that he's planned to speak to Chinese President Xi Jinping about the episode and clear the air between the rival superpowers. Five weeks later, the course is still hasn't happened. After two months of diplomatic sniping and Xi's trip this week to Moscow, where he and Putin jointly denounced the United States, US-China relations have slid to what some say is the worst since the country's normalised ties in the 1970s. And then there's talk about Taiwan, and then we have a quote from William Kirby, a professor of Chinese studies at Harvard University. This is not a good moment for American diplomacy. The last time China and Russia were this close was 1957, when Mao Zedong declared in Moscow the east wind will prevail over the west wind. And now US officials are again asking how to reset the world's most important bilateral relationship. A Biden sea call would be an obvious first step, but despite the efforts of US diplomats, US sources said the Chinese have shown little interest in committing to such a call, which would be their first known interaction since a November meeting at the G20 in Bali. And then we read this. Blinken did meet with Chinese top, China's top lip diplomat Wang Yi at the Munich Security Conference last month after the balloon incident, but this did not so soothe tensions. A source familiar with that conversation called it the most antagonistic US-China engagement since contentious talks in Alaska early in the Biden administration. The person said China had declined to coordinate the meeting, forcing the State Department's top East Asia diplomat, Daniel Crittenbrink, to personally track down Wang Yi at the conference center to ask whether it could happen. So they were running around in Munich trying to find Wang Yi in order to get him to agree to this brief meeting with Blinken. And when it happened, as I discussed at the time, things didn't turn out well. And then we go on to read this. The US decision to shoot down the Chinese balloon on February 4th drew angry complaints from China and Wang called the US reaction hysterical. And then we go on to read this. The sources said frictions were also exacerbated by Biden's State of the Union speech three days later, in which he appeared to question Xi Jinping standing in the world, enraging officials in Beijing. Name me a world leader who'd change places with Xi Jinping. Name me one, said Biden in his speech, evidently referring to a host of domestic and foreign policy challenges facing China. I said at the time that Biden looked incredibly angry when he said it. It seemed to me a case of Biden losing his cool halfway through his, the speech, making these angry comments about Xi Jinping. I thought it was a mistake, and we see how angry it has made the Chinese. Even the US officials appear to be now grudgingly understanding this. And the result is that Xi Jinping is refusing to take a call from Biden. And of course, he's not speaking to Zelensky either. Well, we'll see how long this situation continues for, but I can't help but say 
that it doesn't surprise me at all. The net effect of, Biden's, of the Biden presidency is that the critically important relationship between the United States and Russia has collapsed. And I've discussed that at length in many programs. And I'm not going to repeat what I've said again. But we see that exactly the same is true of what, is ha of what has happened, or, or is coming to be true about what has happened between the United States and China. Xi Jinping, in one meeting, virtual meeting, straightforwardly said to Biden, you tell me one thing about Taiwan, your administration goes and does something completely different. He was already warning Biden that the administration was showing bad faith in its dealings with China. Of course, following that conversation, we had Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. Now there's talk that Kevin McCarthy is heading to Taiwan as well. The United States appears to be ramping up arms supplies and contacts with Taiwan. There's been all these murmurs and rumours and talk about more sanctions against China. And of course, we had those angry comments about China, about Xi Jinping personally, from Biden over the course of that State of the Union address. So, is it so surprising that the Chinese are not prepared to set up another conversation between Biden and Xi Jinping. Why would they trust anything that Biden said to them? And is it perhaps surprising also that they are showing a distinct lack of enthusiasm about setting up a conversation, a call, a meeting between Xi Jinping and Zelensky? who they clearly see and consider to be an American stooge. In the meantime, President Lula of Brazil will soon be in Beijing for a five-day meeting. And perhaps with a view to rubbing salt in America's wounds, he's apparently intending to visit the headquarters of a Chinese company. And that company is none other than Huawei. Apparently, he's going to be meeting with the top team at Huawei. Presumably, it's all about developing 5G technologies in Brazil. Huawei, of course, has been a company ferociously targeted by the United States for sanctions. Its chief financial officer was arrested and held in detention in Canada under US prompting. The Chinese have not forgiven or forgotten that. And Lula is going to meet with them. So, well, <laughs> it's not difficult to see where all this is going. China, Brazil, Russia, well, I've talked about India in previous programs. This strange behaviour of the administration is producing the outcomes that we can all see and the inability of the United States to keep up with Russia in weapons production is having its effect in Beijing also. Well, that's where I end today. Uh, another long video. Thank you for joining me for this programme. More from me soon. Just to remind you, you can find us on all our various platforms, Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin and Telegram. Remember that you can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Also, you can check out our shop, look at the great things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, 
all those great things. And last but not least, please remember, if you've liked this video, to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. So more from me soon. And in the meantime, have a very good day. And we'll see whether we've got more news about any, ch uh, any Ukrainian counteroffensive within the next 24 hours and what really is going to ha happen in Bakhmut over that period.